Also, I posted um, just this morning, I thought it might be helpful for you guys for your outlines, your chapter outlines to have um, the study guide for the exam. I know that sounds crazy, but I put up the study guide for the first exam. <laughs> it's still a ways off. Um, but there's a lot, like I said, in the chapter that I don't cover. And if you wanna outline it, that's fine. But I thought the study guide, it's just bullet points of what you need to know from the chapter, basically what I'm gonna, the topics that I'll cover on the exam. I thought that would be helpful to help you focus your outline. So you don't end up spending a whole lot of time outlining stuff that I'm not even gonna cover in class. Does that make sense? You can use it or not. If you wanna put more in your outline than I have on that study guide, that's fine. But chapters one through three, that'll kind of give you a sort of a skeleton of your outline if you wanna use it that way. Then you can ignore the stuff in the chapter that I don't have on that uh, study guide. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, use it if you want to. And like I said, if not, don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, as a reminder, your first outline is due Friday. You'll upload it to Canvas. If you want me to take a look at it ahead of time, that's fine. But this first one is really kind of just a, like I said, sort of a rough draft. If you don't put the amount of detail in that I think I, that I'm looking for, I'll let you know, but you'll still get full credit. So just, you know, don't stress about it too much. This will be kind of a dry run. Okay, what am I doing? Okay, so we ended here. I was talking about the three, um, the three main themes that will kind of show up over and over in this course. Structure determining function is the first one. This one's pretty straightforward. Uh, like I said, it's um, the anatomy is going to determine the physiology of a system. It'll come up over and over again how cells are structured um, will determine what a tissue can do, for example. So this one, I don't have a whole lot more to say about. It'll just come up many, many times this semester. So we're gonna continue on with the second theme that I talked about. And that is homeostasis. So hey, homeostasis gets a little more involved um, than the structure and function kind of theme. Homeostasis is, I think you've probably heard this term before. The idea is just to, at least from a human anatomy physiology perspective, to help keep an, a stable <clears throat> internal environment. So this doesn't mean that it stays the same all the time. We're talking about within like, within happy ranges is what I think of it as. Um, so homeostasis, technically, if you break down the term, it means steady state. but it does not mean constant. So don't think, if you think about body temperature as an example, I'll use body temperature as a example throughout this uh, discussion of homeostasis. 98.6 is our body temperature, right? That's the average body temperature of a person. Sometimes your body temperature is lower, sometimes it's higher. The idea behind homeostasis is to stay right within the safe range around 98.6. So when you wake up in the morning, your body temperature is probably lower than 98.6. If you are outside running on a 95 degree day, it's probably well above 98.6, but within a tolerance range. That's the idea behind homeostasis. Not constant, but sort of always shifting and changing to try to stay at this, what we call a set point. So yeah, basically, like I just said, continual variation, body systems are always adjusting. Your blood pH changes often. A lot of it depends on how heavily you're breathing. Um, blood sugar levels change a lot. Uh, so con depending on what it, whether you've just eaten or you ate four hours ago. So staying within these normal ranges is the goal of your body. That's the homeostasis goal. Does 
Has anyone ever had blood work done? And you get the results back and you see like all these numbers. So you have the number that was read from your blood and then next to it, ideally, um, there's a range, like a normal range. That's, the, that's that range that I'm talking about, sort of the tolerance values. If you're within that range, awesome. If you're above or below, there might be something to worry about. Maybe not, um, but that's the idea behind this homeostasis. Hopefully that maybe makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, okay. Now we're gonna talk about a couple of different feedback mechanisms. The first one, um, negative feedback. So there's negative and positive. I'm gonna focus a lot more on negative feedback because that's what typically drives homeostasis in the body. And I'll define each of these and tell you the difference between them. So a negative feedback is a mechanism designed to maintain homeostasis in the body where the, if there's a stimulus pushing, say your temperature in an upward direction, your body's gonna respond by bringing your temperature back down. So the stimulus and the response are in opposite directions. That's the easiest, simplest definition of a negative feedback when we're talking about human physiology. If your body temperature goes up, you want your, the homeostatic mechanisms in your body to bring your temperature back down, right? That's negative. They're going in opposite directions. Positive is not that. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Temperature regulation, like I said, that's an excellent example of a negative feedback type of homeostasis. If you're really hot, your temperature goes up, your body's gonna start sweating to release some heat, that'll bring your temperature back down. Just kind of keep it within that happy medium. Blood pressure, blood glucose, blood sugar. Those are other examples of negative feedback mechanisms in our body. If your blood pressure goes up, your body will adjust if it can, <laughs> if it goes up, your blood pressure, um, your body will adjust and decrease your blood pressure so you don't put a lot of strain on your heart and your blood vessels. So homeostasis is really controlled by this negative feedback, that opposite direction, stimulus and response going in the opposite direction. Positive feedback, I'll talk about a few slides from now after I give you probably too many examples of negative feedback. Um, but positive feedback doesn't contribute to homeostasis. We have positive feedback cycles in our body, and I'm not gonna define it yet, um, just so I don't muddy the water quite yet, but positive feedback doesn't really contribute to this homeostasis. It doesn't do the same thing as a negative feedback, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when you think homeostasis, think negative feedback. That's what's keeping our internal environment stable, negative feedback. And this can get confusing, the negative positive feedback idea. Um, so if after I go over this, you still don't really understand the difference, please ask and I'll try to give some other examples. Okay. So you can think of our temperature regulation of negative feedback, kind of like a thermostat, like a thermostat in your house. If the temperature drops too low, the thermostat kicks on and brings the temperature back up, right? That's what our body does. I guess slightly in a more slightly complicated way, <laughs> but that's how we control our temperature. If the body, if there's sensors inside the body and outside the body that can determine what the temperature is. If that changes too much, it'll either kick the heat on or kick the air conditioning on in your body. So that's a nice analogy. Once it gets back to that happy temperature within the range, within the normal range, it will stop. Um, stop their response. So in a human, here we go. We have what's called the set point 98.6 is, you know, the average human body temperature. If we just draw that all the way across, we call that the set point. We fluctuate around it. Like I said, sometimes your body is hotter or cooler than 98.6, depending on time of day, what you've been doing, et cetera. So if the temperature goes up too high, so too high over 98.6, you start sweating, that's gonna bring 
after you start sweating, it's going to bring the temperature back down. You're releasing heat through the water that is being sweated out of your body. On the opposite end, if you get too cold, like today, it's freaking freezing outside. If your body temperature goes down, you start shivering and that muscle movement will heat up the internal environment of your body and bring you back towards the set point. Pretty simple concept. Um, like I said, body temperature is just a really easy, great example of that negative feedback. But again, it doesn't mean we're always at 98.6. We're going up and down <laughs> kind of constantly. We don't notice it, which is nice, typically. Um, it's a good thing that we don't notice it. Our body, if you're not noticing a change in body temperature all that often, that means your body's doing what it needs to do. Blood pressure is another good example of a negative feedback system. Have you ever gotten up too fast and you feel like kind of lightheaded and everything goes white? <laughs> that means that your blood pressure was for some reason too low. Oftentimes when you wake up in the morning, your blood pressure is low. Um, everything kind of slows down at night. If you stand up too fast, you don't have enough blood flowing throughout your body um, and your, your heart will recognize that. So there's receptors and I'll talk about some different terminology for this um, on the next slide. But there's receptors that register that change in blood pressure. It's too low when you stand up. So the response would be, well, we'll send information to your brain. The response will be in the heart. So your heart rate speeds up to increase blood pressure. That means you're not gonna pass out, right? If that doesn't happen, maybe you pass out, which is not good. So ideally in a perfect homeostatic mechanism, you have some kind of sensor that senses something's off, sends information to the brain, and then the brain sends information to the organ to fix it, fix whatever's wrong. Blood pressure is a great example of that negative feedback too. Any questions about that so far? Okay. There's three terms that go along with these homeostatic mechanisms. So you have something in your body, like I sort of just mentioned there with the heart or the blood vessels above the heart, where your, bo your body has to recognize that something is off, right? That's the receptor. It's also called a sensor. You'll see that on, I think the next slide. So receptor slash sensor, that's like the data collection area. It's collecting data constantly. So your receptors are always collecting data, say, on blood pressure. That's kind of the first step in this homeostasis situation. So you have to have receptors. And again, depending on what, um, what system we're talking about, if it's body temperature, it might be temperature sensors in the skin, for example. So the receptor then sends information constantly to the integrating or the control center. So that's usually your brain. Your brain does most of the data analysis. That's kind of how I think of it. So, oops, sorry guys. Data collection, data analysis. Um, the integrating control center depends. There's different parts of your brain that do different things, but for now we're just gonna say it's your brain that's the control center and it takes that information in and then makes a decision. So it's the decision maker. What is your body gonna do to respond to say the change in blood pressure? And I will say here, I'll kind of stop since I've already mentioned, there's two terms for both of these, receptor, which I wrote here, receptor or sensor, and then integrating or control center. You're gonna see this throughout this semester. Sometimes there are multiple terms for multiple words for one term. It can get really annoying. Um, I include the ones that are used frequently. So integrating a control center are used fairly interchangeably. So I want you guys to know both of those. If there's multiple terms and one is outdated, I'm going to say, don't worry about this term. Just know this one. So that's something to make note of. But yeah, for these, um, the integrating control center, same, same idea, but you'll see both of them. All right, so we've got the decision maker. And then after that, something has to happen, right? You make a decision and then the brain is gonna send that decision out to what's called an effector. 
an effector has an effect. That's what does the does the work of actually making a change to the physiology. So your heart in this case would be the effector. If we're talking about blood pressure, so say blood pressure decreases, it'll be sensed, the brain will kind of analyze that data and then send a message to the heart to say, okay, you need to increase the heart rate in order to increase blood pressure back to the normal range. So these are kind of the three parts, three steps of maintaining homeostasis. And this slide just shows that same idea. So here we have sensor instead of receptor, right? It's annoying having these different terms, but sensor control effector. And then over here, an example using body temperature. So in this case, if the body temperature goes too high, nerve cells in the skin and the brain are gonna register that, they're the sensor. So this is just kind of paralleling, right? This is an example of these general terms. So the nerve cells will sense that change in temperature, send the information to the brain. The temp temperature regulatory center in the brain will make a decision. It'll analyze the data, say, make a decision on how to decrease the temperature of the body, sends information out to the effector, which would be the sweat glands typically, and then you start sweating. So when we break it down like this, it's pretty simple. Obviously there's a lot that goes into it and it's complicated, but when we're talking about homeostasis for now, this is really the, the crux of it and what I want you to understand for how our bodies stay within this normal range. All right, so negative feedback, that's what we've been talking about, right? If there's a stimulus in one direction, the response goes in the opposite direction. If your temperature goes up, your body is going to have a response to bring the temperature back down. Positive feedback is where it is not involved in homeostasis, like I said. It's where, as I said, as I noted here, deviation or change keeps going in the same direction. So we don't want that to happen with body temperature, right? If your body temperature goes up and then there's a positive feedback that kicks in and makes your body temperature go even higher, that's a bad thing. So body temperature, blood pressure, all of those follow a negative feedback. But we do have positive feedbacks in our body that are important. So I wanna talk about those very briefly next. So positive feedback is a mechanism that intensifies a change in the body. So I think of it as amplifying that signal. change leads to more change in the same direction. It doesn't bounce it back to a normal range. It intensifies the reaction. You can call it a self-amplifying cycle. Once it starts, it kind of makes that response bigger and bigger in that same direction. Change produces more change is a good way to think of it. But I would say change produces more change in the same direction. That's the difference. Negative feedback, it goes in the opposite direction. Positive feedback, it continues on in that same direction. Does anyone have any guesses as to what might be a positive feedback in our body? This is tough because it seems weird. I'll give you some examples, but any ideas? Okay, I'll give you some examples. The best example is childbirth. So childbirth is based on a positive feedback. So the actual labor part. If the uterus, if we were talking about a negative feedback mechanism here, uterus contracting is what expels the fetus, right? What expels the baby. 
Um, if it was a negative feedback, that contraction would be followed by relaxation to bring it back to the norm. We don't want that. You want the uterus to contract further and further until it pushes the baby out. So that's an excellent example of a positive feedback. More contraction, so one contraction leads to further and further contraction of the uterus until the baby is born. A negative feedback would not work well here. <laughs> Blood clotting is something that probably more people can relate to. Um, if you cut yourself, your blood clots, right? If it starts to clot and then it was a if it was a negative feedback mechanism, it would become liquid again and declot and you keep bleeding, right? You want more clotting, more and more clotting. That's a positive feedback. Once your blood starts clotting, it sends out chemicals to basically create more clotting. You want to clot the blood in order to stop up that wound. And then generation of nerve signals, I'm not really going to talk about, but that's another, another example. So does that make sense? Positive versus negative feedback? Okay. Again, positive feedback does not play into homeostasis because you keep pushing it in one direction, right? You're not going back to an average. Okay. That's all for homeostasis right now. Um, the third theme that I mentioned out of our three themes was human structure. And this is generally, it's referred to as the hierarchy of complexity. You've probably seen this. Um, I know we cover it in biology 1101 here, probably maybe 1102 even. Um, the idea behind this is just that we can break an organism down into really tiny pieces and then build those pieces together into the whole organism, right? So we're gonna start looking at humans from a pretty small scale. We are gonna start with chemistry. That's gonna be the next chapter that we'll talk about. So we're a bunch of atoms, essentially. All of the atoms that work together in order to kind of increase in complexity and form an organism. So you can break us down into atoms. Those atoms are gonna to work together to create cells. Cells work together to create tissues. Tissues work together to create organs organs, create organ systems, and then eventually you get a whole human. We are going to talk about, like I said, chemistry. We'll do kind of a review. I know chemistry is not a prerequisite for this class. Hopefully you've had some introduction to chemistry, even if it's in like another biology class, but I'll make sure everyone's on the same page with the biological side of chemistry. We'll get into some cellular stuff. So there's a whole chapter on cells and organelles, which is again, hopefully a review and then tissues. So tissues will be kind of the first, unless you've had an AMP class before, it'll be sort of the first really new material when we talk about tissues and how those cells work together to form different kinds of tissues. So you'll see us kind of go through this trajectory from simple to more complex throughout the semester. And this is just another diagram. I probably don't need this, but I didn't mention molecule, macromolecule, or organelle. Those are kind of, if we break down cells even further um, between the atom and the cell level, you can think of it that way. And then here are just some definitions. Um, I know some people like having a few more words and definitions. So I put these up here. I think everyone knows what a cell is. When we consider something alive, it has to be made of at least one cell. So this is the basic unit of life, a cell. Something can be made of one cell, like a bacterium, or um, we have about 37 trillion cells that make up our bodies, give or take a few, I suppose. Um, so 
cells we'll talk about like I said that'll be chapter three I think three <laughs> tissues are a group of cells working together in case you don't have that definition and then organs and organ systems so again just building up in that organizational or structural hierarchy <laughs> it's important to keep that in mind um, when we're talking about tissues it's easy to forget that it's just a bunch of individual cells that are working together and communicating with each other i think people have an idea of what an organ is and what an organ system is tissues are a little more a little less well known Questions so far? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I should just delete the slide. Here's cells. <laughs> We're not talking about prokaryotes at all. Um, like I said, cells are the basic unit of life. Prokaryotes are single cell organisms like bacteria. We're not really going to talk about them at all. We are eukaryotes, which means we are made up of more than one cell, obviously. And they're complicated inside. So we'll talk about the organelles in chapter three. Yeah, not much else to say about that slide. Tissues. Tissues will be the first kind of difficult chapter. Well, I think the first really difficult chapter that we get into in AMP. Up until then, it'll be mostly be review from general biology, which is nice. Um, yeah, tissues are, like I said, cells working together. So you can see that really nicely in this epithelial tissue. These are just all individual cells with their nuclei working together. Um, epithelial tissue is like your skin, the, the lining of your body, essentially. There's four different types, four different general categories. You don't need to worry about them now. I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up as to kind of a little bit more of an idea of what a tissue is. We will be talking about these in lecture and in lab, and you'll be very tired of hearing about tissues, um, but you'll learn to identify them and learn what they do and how they're structured. Okay, but for now, just know that tissues are cells working together. And then next we move into organ systems. Um, I kind of skipped over organs. Organs make up organ systems, obviously. These are Yeah, so this is divided into 10 organ systems. In lab, your lab manual divides it into, and we go over organ systems this week in lab, if you haven't had lab yet, 11. Um, musculoskeletal, here it's combined, muscular and skeletal systems. We're separating them and talking about them separately. Um, so that's the only difference. If you see 10 versus 11, it's usually muscular and skeletal mushed together. Um, the organ systems that we cover in AMP1, we only cover three, well, I guess four if you split up muscular and skeletal. The rest are covered in AMP2. So you cover a lot more systems in AMP2. The reason for that is mostly because we have this sort of review of chemistry and cells before we get into even tissues. So we don't cover as many organ systems in here, but we'll talk about the integumentary system, which is your skin um the nervous system and then muscular and skeletal systems uh from this and i'm going to go over each organ system a little in a little more detail um i want you to know the main organs and their functions for each system so i have um a worksheet here from another lab manual for those of you on zoom i posted this to uh, to Canvas. So you should have this. Um, if you want to take notes on it, that's fine. This is just sort of a way for you to organize the information I'm about to go over for these different organ systems. We're not going over all of these. We're not going into detail. Like I said, we're only going to cover four of them. Um, but in order, a lot of them interact. So I want you to know some of the basics, just the basic information about each of these organ systems for here. I am going to tell you the functions that I want you to know and then the specific organs that I want you to know. It doesn't include all of them that are listed here. So this is kind of a, a way for you to know what I'm going to ask on the exam. I guess it's a, a good way to think about it. Okay, so I'm making this out. And you can, you don't have to use this if you just want to take notes on 
in your notebook, that's fine. And you thought this would be a helpful organizational all right so here's where i'm going to tell you what you need to know basically we're going to go through each of these you probably know a good bit about a lot of these organ systems some of them are a little less familiar um lymphatic and endocrine systems are like yeah i've heard that term but i don't exactly know what they are you probably have an idea of what the respiratory system does, right? So some of these will be easy, some will be a little bit more complicated. All right, so I think these are all mm, mostly the same order. So these first four are on the first page of this handout, which is helpful. So I'm just going to run through each of these. I'm going to tell you the organs that I want you to know for each one and then the functions. This is, like I said, a a very introductory level and i'm not even including all of the organs or all of the functions, so this is a an overview of the organ systems. First integumentary system that's hair skin and nails. Those are the organs. And you probably heard that the skin is the largest organ right maybe the skin is our largest organ. Um, the integumentary system, the whole purpose of it really is to enclose our internal organs. If we didn't have skin, it would be weird. Um, our, our internal organs wouldn't have, it's like a package, like a nice little packaging. So that's really all you need to know function wise for the integumentary system. It encloses our internal organs. Skeletal system, what do you think the main organs are of the skeletal system? Bones, yeah, bones are organs, which we don't think of them as organs, but they are. They change, you basically regrow your skeleton throughout your life multiple times. So it's pretty cool. Um, bones are the main organs and it basically provides support. That's the whole, the main goal of the skeletal system, providing support. On to the muscular system, the main organs here, muscles. There's multiple kinds of muscles, we'll get into that, but for now, just know the organs of the muscular system, the main one is our muscles. Some of this is so simple, it probably doesn't even need to be said. <laughs> What's the purpose of the muscular system? What's the main one? What do your muscles help you do? Move, yeah, it's for movement. the nervous system the main organs i want you to know really the brain and the spinal cord we have a bunch of nerves running nerves running throughout our body but we won't include those in this we'll just say brain and spinal cord those are the primary organs of the nervous system and what does our nervous system do it does a lot of stuff but what's one thing that it does it processes information like I talked about with the homeostasis stuff it, it it takes in information and makes decisions so information processing. And it's also really important um, sensory wise so it takes in that that information as well. So sensory and information processing. I think next up I have the reproductive systems. So those are actually the last two on the last page. A little bit out of order. We're gonna keep these really basic because we don't go over these at all in this class. So male and female reproductive systems are separated, but for the organs, because they differ so much between males and females, just put sex organs, it's fine. I think you guys probably have an idea of what that is. So sex organs would be the organs. And what's the purpose? 
reproduction. <laughs> it is that easy <laughs> to reproduce, make more people. For the female, another big purpose is to house and develop the embryo or the fetus. It's weird to say house, housing the fetus. <laughs> Okay, that's all I'm gonna ask about potentially for the reproductive systems. Um, next we have endocrine and cardiovascular. So the endocrine system, this is one that often gets overlooked, but it's really critically important in every functionality of our body. Um, this, the endocrine system releases hormones. So hormones are made and released from the endocrine system. Hormones are essentially just chemicals that send messages around the body. Um, the, there's a lot of organs and glands involved in the endocrine system. The ones I want you to know are pancreas and thyroid gland. The pancreas is a very important endocrine organ. And so is the thyroid gland, but there's a lot. To simplify things, just know pancreas and thyroid. Most people probably at least heard of the thyroid gland, right? You can have hyper hypothyroidism and that'll kind of affect your metabolism um, if things aren't functioning correctly. So yeah, just know those two. Cardiovascular, super easy. What's the main organ in the cardiovascular system. The heart, yeah. And the function of the cardiovascular system, obviously to pump blood around the body, but that blood is carrying gases like oxygen and nutrients. So transport of oxygen and nutrients is kind of the main if you break it down, that's why the cardiovascular system is pumping blood to get nutrients and oxygen to organs. And then the last four. The lymphatic system, another sort of overlooked one that we've heard about, but don't really know what it is. Um, the purpose of the lymphatic system is to filter fluid from the blood and then return it to the blood. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but there's stuff in the blood that we wanna take out. So it filters the blood and returns fluid to the blood. The lymphatic system is really important in immunity as well. So lymphatic and immune systems, I don't have the immune system separate because we always sort of lump them together, lymphatic and immune system. Um, so it's really important in immunity. So when you think lymphatic system, think immune system as well. Uh, the main pieces of the lymphatic system I want you to know are the lymph nodes, what else? the lymph nodes and the spleen are the two big ones. So you've heard of lymph nodes, um, that's where a lot of the filtration takes place. And the spleen is really important in, immune, in the immune system, the immune response. So if your spleen's messed up or um, you have to have a splenectomy. You have your spleen taken out for one reason or another. Your immune system is really hampered. All right, so that's lymphatic. Um, respiratory, <clears throat> the lungs, obviously, the biggest part of the respiratory system. That's the only organ you really need to know. Uh, 
And the purpose of the respiratory system is to um, transport gases, gas exchange, sorry, gas exchange, but bring oxygen in and release carbon dioxide. All right, two more. They're pretty easy. The last two are digestive and urinary systems. I think everyone knows what the digestive system does. Basically uh, breaks down food and absorbs nutrients. There are a lot of organs involved in the digestive system. For now, just be familiar with, what did I? Stomach, oh yeah, stomach and the intestines. Stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Those are the kind of big workhorses, workhorses of the digestive system. I guess you could think of it that way. But you can see a lot of others. There's a lot involved in the digestive system. And then finally, urinary um, that filters the blood, another blood filtration for nitrogenous wastes. So I don't think it says that up here, but specifically wastes that contain a lot of nitrogen. Nitrogen is really toxic to the body. Um, so getting it out of there is the urinary system's goal. And it also helps balance the water volume in our body. If you drink a lot of water, you pee a lot. If you don't drink enough water, <laughs> And you don't peel off, right? It's just balancing how much water there is essentially in the blood. So water balance and excretion of nitrogenous wastes. Those are the two big functions of the urinary system. And the kidneys and the bladder, those are the main organs that are involved. All right. I think that's it. Questions about any of those? On Friday, we'll get into this, which we're actually covering in lab this week. Um, yeah, we'll finish up this chapter on Friday.